foundations you have made Who has measured your strength? Who has fathomed your ways? Who has weighed out your wisdom? Oh, ancient of days Who has measured your strength? Who has fathomed your ways? Who has weighed out your wisdom? Oh, ancient of days
me smell the fragrance of your touch. Let me see your lovely face. Take me away. Let's look at our voices. See the Lord, Lord God. Let me know the kisses of your mouth. Let me feel your Smell the fragrance of your touch. Let me see your lovely face. Take me away. Even so, Lord God. And I Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Greater love has no one than this, than one would lay down his life for his friends. Thank you for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you for proving your love towards us on that crucifixion day. Thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you. You are my world. 
me to his banqueting table. taking us into a new level of relationship of a place of believing and receiving so today in this house we thank you for the heavens that's been rent for Christ that came down died on that cross and now the things that the eye have not seen the ear hath not heard neither has come up in the heart of man you are busy revealing them to us by your spirit so let this be a great day of revelation where the greatness and the glory and the power of God will break through every heart and every ministry that we will go out to know God we're not looking for doom and destruction we're looking for the kingdom of God to take over on the face of the earth we are excited for our God is the God of the universe the Lord of life the author of all good things the father of lights with whom there is no variableness neither shadow of turning thank you that we have the spirit of the son inside of us crying father father thank you for peace that passes all understanding to rule govern and keep every heart and every mind in Christ Jesus thank you for the manifestation of the presence of the living Christ in the midst of his church Jesus you said you will build this church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it so this morning there's nothing that can stand against the force of the kingdom of God that's busy invading this earth with such power such intensity we pray let your glory fill every life and every heart may your glory be great in Jesus name thank you well like somebody say I see you look better than yesterday <laughs> tell somebody else God is good God is gracious, God is merciful, and His mercies are new every morning.
Well, hallelujah. We're grateful for God's dealings with us during the course of last night and yesterday. We're very excited for what's been happening. I think lives have been changed already. So uh, we thank God. Remember tomorrow morning, it's very important. Don't miss it. Be here. And uh, last night, what time did we finish? 11.30, 12 o'clock? It was just by midnight. And uh, I tell you, it was just another great visitation. The word right through the day was just awesome. So we thank and praise and honor God for His grace. And uh, welcome all the newcomers. There's a lot that was here yesterday that couldn't be here today. There's a lot here today that couldn't be here yesterday. And there are others that's coming tomorrow for the, for the, <laughs> for the anointing service. So what are we going to do tomorrow? Uh, we did it, I think, two years ago. We had a long table here. So in front of the table, there's going to be a table with a lot of prayer cloths that I've prayed over for a few months. They are anointed. Acts 19, 11, and 12. Then we're going to have a long table with the broken body of the Lord and the blood of the New Testament. And for those who've never been where we share the revelation of 1 Corinthians 11, be here. And then you're going to go to the bath and you're going to be anointed with the mixture of oil according to the Bible recipe. Then you're going to walk through the pool and we'll carry you out on the other side. So just one or two announcements. Tonight, please, 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 you've got to be very early tonight because our church will also be here tonight. So tonight we're going to have the, the church and the hall full of people. So there's another four, five hundred people coming tonight that's not here today. So really be early tonight. And you can keep your place. But if you are not here quarter to seven, we remove your stuff because there's another 500 people at least coming tonight. I mean, so just again about the television thing, for those who came in late, uh, they've switched, it, switched us over during the course of the night. So we are now broadcasting over all of Africa, Sub-Sahara, Saudi Arabia, United Kingdom, all of Europe. So, uh, yeah. So in Ireland, they can see us now. In England, they can see us. In France, they can see us. In Europe, they can see us. Parts of Asia, India can see us. So that's excited. And if you are a preacher and you want to know about it, come see Peter afterwards. There's still time available, but by next month, there will not be a lot of time. So uh, between 11 and 12 in the mornings, we've given that to Afrikaans. You know, because we're broadcasting all over the world, so the Afrikaans slot is just between 11 and 12 in the morning, and that's a much cheaper slot as well. And, uh, but I think there's only about two slots open. So if you are Afrikaans and you think you got a message, don't come. But if you know you got a message, please come. So uh, God is really giving us favor. This morning I spoke to Rogers Gamuti, the international sales manager of Centec, and he said, uh, he said, Kubis, I never thought this channel is so popular. They were off for half an hour this morning when they did the switchings over for half an hour. He said, there's not one telephone at Centec that didn't stop ringing. He said, and everyone, where's Spirit Word? Where's Spirit Word? Where's Spirit Word? And uh, Really, really, I would love them to be here. And uh, they were here uh, at one of our other conferences until they said, I didn't know this channel was so favorite. And they just shifted us down to two channels from nine to seven on the Vivid. So if you haven't got multi choice decoders, please, you don't have to get one. You can buy a Vivid decoder and you can get it here from us for very cheap 1,100 Rand now. The prices have come down. And no monthly subscriptions after that, no yearly subscriptions. You get SABC 1, 2, 3, SABC Africa, ETV. But above that, you get five Christian channels. And if you love the Sabbath, you can also get the Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> <laughs> they also on there. <laughs> on, uh, uh, there's some good preachers there. Yeah. 
It's just a pity they put the day above Jesus. But they, they do good. There's a lot of them that does good. And so we thank God for that. And they, they, they got a lot of good preachers on there. So uh, we thank God for that. So there are decoders available. And if you've got a multi-choice decoder and you don't know how to tune in, you've got to upgrade your decoder. You don't have to pay. You just have to tune in with your remote control. And that information has been in your envelope that you get, got at the door. Now, when you got your envelope, there's a paper in there that says, My Pledge. So we're not going to do pledges on TV to beg for money. That pledge we do at our conferences. So if you want to pledge something from your church or from yourself towards the, towards the channel, you can just fill it in, put it sometime in the offering that we know the money is coming, and you take it home and pay it in in the next week or so. Is that fine? And then the, there's a debit form in there as well. Now the debit form is not for 1,000 rand. But if you can, you can. It's just for something like 50 rand or 100 rand that you won't miss monthly. So you fill it in, take it to your bank. Don't give it to us. Take it to your bank. And if 1,000 people can deduct 100 rand a month, hmm, it's already a lot of money. You know, The running cost for this channel is just 500,000 a month. We've been on for three months, and the good news is we've got credit till November. That's how the money came in. So I think that is awesome. Uh, if we think of how people struggling to get finances, I think God is very good to us. That we've got credit until November. That's how we've paid the money, and that's how the money came in the first month that we were on television. So we thank God for all the people that were so gracious. Now, my welcome, young. And like of here, your path long come. How many enjoyed the word yesterday? How many enjoyed the moving of the Spirit last night? Wasn't it awesome, man? I, I, people didn't want to leave you. They just said, can I sleep here? Can I sleep here? Can I sleep here? I said, uh, well, well, Ben's going to speak about the offering this morning. Ben Clannons, just welcome. Come, Ben. Come, pray with the men. He's just going to share something that's on his heart. God bless you. Hallelujah. Good morning. Amen. Wonderful to be here this morning. Amen. Yeah. Mm. Hallelujah. Awesome times in the presence of God. Hallelujah. You know, it's a real privilege for us as, as men and women of God to be able to sit under such an anointing and to receive. You know, if you travel the world as much as I do, then uh, you would really realize that this is a, a fountain. This is like Bethel, a house of bread. We can be replenished, you know, and, and, and fed and filled amen we just got back from australia me and my wife was the first time we've we've been there and uh, that's um and i've just been on every continent of the world now and um i tell you within the first day or two my wife said do you think we at the right place i said why she said there's no anointing here you know we we, we measure australia according to heel songs but let me tell you something there was no anointing and if there's something that will drain you, it will be a service like that. It takes everything out of you. Amen. Okay, I don't want to speak about that. Kubus asked me to take up the offering. And I just want to share quickly for a few minutes just something out of my, my experience. And I will not teach you something that I don't live. It's one of the policies that I have. It's got to be, first of all, revelation to me. And it's got to be something that, I put, that I've put in practice in my own life. Psalm 105, the last couple of few verses, don't, don't turn there, it's in, in, in the Message Bible, it says this. God was speaking to Abraham. And one day while I was reading the Bible, uh, and in my prayer time, and I was reading out of the Message Bible, and God says, make that passage applicable to your life. Put your name there, because God was speaking to Abraham, so I'm sending you to in another country. And this is what that passage says. And God was speaking to me. Now, the sending is not important. It's the second part that's important that's applicable to your life. God was saying, I'm sending you as a gift to the nations. Then he says the following. Now, this is the important part. To help them. What? Seize the wealth of the nations so that they can do everything I have commanded them to do and could follow my instructions 
to the letter. Oh, hallelujah. That implies that if we as the church of Jesus Christ do not have the wealth of the nations, we will never be able to fulfill all of the commandments that God has given us or follow His instructions to the letter. So you and I as men and women of God, we need the wealth of the nations. And God needs to give us revelation knowledge. God needs to give us insight and people with an anointing on their lives to come and show us the church how to get hold of that wealth so that we can do what God has required us to do. Amen. Now Ecclesiastes 10:19 uh, says the B part is the following, but money answers everything. Hallelujah. You thought it was just the anointing. But money If you had enough money today, then 99.99999% of all of your problems would be gone. Come on, let's get real. Hallelujah. If you had enough finances today and doing what God has required you to do, you would have no problems to reach the lost. It's all about money, honey. Now, two things. It might sound negative, but it, once again, out of my experience. I've realized that many times men of God would invite you to their church. Now, I don't want to talk about prostituting the gifts and all those kinds of things. But they, especially when it comes to finances and, and other things as well, they would want you to come and, and teach their people on finances. They want their church to give, but they don't. You can only as pastors, as reverends, as doctors, as priests, or whatever you want to call yourself, you can only take your people as far as you have gone. You cannot lead them into prosperity if you have a, a poverty mentality yourself. There's no way your church will grow above your revelation and what you live when it comes concerning finances. I'm sorry. Like Annalise said, I'm sorry. That's the one thing. And the other thing that I've realized is that, uh, people forgive me, don't throw me with stones now, as Kuba said. And I don't want to generalize this, but this is one second. <laughs> Hallelujah. My mama, my mama. <laughs> and I don't want to generalize this, please. But let me tell you something. And I think there's men of God that will understand this this morning. But I've realized that there are few pastors that really has faith for finances. <laughs> really? Come on, let's be real. We want the finances. Yes, we've heard God speak to us. We've got a vision. We've got, we, we know that God has spoken to us to concerning what we have to do for Him and the city, the town that you're in, or whatever ministry you're in. But you don't have the, fi the faith to, to get hold of that finances. It, one of the reasons is because you don't apply this thing in your own life. You don't walk it out first and then show your people not tell them, show them how it's done. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to preach, but you know, this, this part of the grace of my life. It's not the only grace that I have, by the way. I'm just going to quickly show you a principle in the Bible. Now, some of you heard me preach this whole message. I'm not going to preach a message. I'm just going to show you something quickly. It comes out of Psalm 126. It's one of my favorite messages that God has given me. And it says the following. I'm going to quickly read it to you. This is out of the NIV. Uh, I don't have... Last time I was here, he looked at my Bible and said, Oh, you got the right Bible. I had the King James with the Amplified. But I contributed my, my last Bible towards affirmative shopping a couple of days ago. So the one I'm using now is the NIV. 
Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. The King James says, when the Lord turned the captivity of Zion. Zion the church. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations. Who's the nations? It's the world. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we were, we were filled with joy. Restore our fortunes like the streams and then give. Verse 5, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Now verse 5, we used to quote like that in the old days. Those who sow tears will reap joy. Now that's not what that passage says. And you cannot loosen verse 5 and verse 6 from the rest of that passage. You have to read in context to be able to understand what God is trying to say to His church. And this is what He said. Verse 5. Those who sow in tears. Those who carry seed crying and weeping while they're sowing. Those are the ones that will reap with joy. You, listen. You cannot give God something that costs you nothing. Is it the help me or, or what? <laughs> Listen, you cannot give God something that costs you nothing. That's what Samuel said in 2 Samuel 24, 24, when he wanted to buy the threshing floor of Varuna to, to build God an altar, to, 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 to put a sacrifice on it, and to ask God to remove the plague from his people. And Aruna said to him, King David, you can have this threshing floor. He said, no, 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 no. I will not offer to my God something that costs me nothing. You've got to give God something that costs you something. It's going to be your most prized possession. The one that's closest to your heart. The one that touches your life. If it does not touch your life, it cannot touch God. And we're crying. Let me show you. This is a small principle. We're crying. We say, God, change our captivity. The church of Jesus Christ is in bondage, in poverty, in slavery when it comes to finances. We want to be loose, to be freed, but we don't give God something that costs us something. Now, I, I don't want to stay long here. The Bible says this. When we give God something... That costs us something. Our most prized possession, the thing that's closest to our heart, the thing that is our life. Then God will turn our captivity. And when He turned our captivity, we will be like men who dream. You will say, oh my God, this is too good to be true. Look at all these things that God is doing for me. I cannot believe it. Just don't wake me up. Oh, just look at all the splendor, the glory, all of these wonderful things that start to happen to me. Then the Bible says our mouths were filled with laughter. And then the next verse says this. And then it was said among the nations, the world, the Lord has done great things for them. Now let me tell you something. The world is not interested, ask Quibus, if you heal the sick. They're not interested if you raise the dead they don't care they care squat there's only one thing that will draw the attention of the world to the church money honey money makes the world go round that is the only commodity the only thing that the world is interested in if God start to turn around the captivity of the church, start to bless the church with such magnitude that we seem as if we are dreaming, then the attention of the world will get drawn to the church and then we have the power, the influence to tell them and direct them towards Jesus Christ. Now, just quickly, I'm going to show you an example in the Bible of, just, of what I just told you. Turn to, to Genesis 40, uh, 41. If you will, please. I'm trying to get it to this thing as quick as possible. There's, there's much more in it, people. I'm just touching here and there. Genesis 41, verse 57. 
And all the countries came to Egypt. Egypt is the world or the world system. To buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the world. Famine speaks of lack, not having enough poverty. So we see there was poverty or there was lack all over the world. And everybody had to go down to Egypt to be able to buy grain from Joseph. You remember the story about the dream that Pharaoh had and the whole thing about Joseph. Now, chapter 42, verse 1. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. Listen to this. But Jacob did not send Benjamin. Why? Joseph's brothers were the others. Because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's son or the church were, were among those who went to buy grain for the famine was in the land of Canaan, the church also. And we know that Joseph was the governor and he was the one that sold grain to all his people. Now famine all over the world. Everybody lacking. The whole, everybody, if you want to live, you had to go down to Egypt to go buy grain from Joseph. Now just imagine this, you guys that have been in the army. If everybody had to come down to Stillfontein from all over the world, there must be some sort of a system in place whereby they could buy grain from Joseph because the Bible says that Joseph was the one that sold grain to them. So I could just imagine, I'm making an assumption now, how these guys would stand these long lines and queues day after day in the sun, the heat, and the dust, like we did in the army, to be able to come to the forefront of the line to buy grain from Joseph. And the Bible says that Jacob heard about the provision that there was in Egypt, the world. And he sent some of his sons down there, but he did not send Benjamin because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So they went down and they stood in these long lines, day after day, sun heat in the dust. Eventually come to the forefront of the line and they buy a bag of dry grain. And they went home. People, there's no distinction between us, the church, and the people out there in the world. We are happy and complacent just as they are to stand in these long queues day after day, the same system, the same rules of the world applying to us and applicable to our lives. Just to be able to come to the forefront of the line to buy a bag of dry grain, living like hobos out of bags. While God is saying, we just sang it, I could spread a table before you in the wilderness. But we are happy and complacent. And there's no distinction between us and the world. We're standing there day after day after day after day, living according to the same rules. And we see the next chapter where they went back home and they ate up all the grain. And, they found, and this is what it says in, in chapter 43, verse 1. Now the famine was still to be in the land. So when they had eaten all the grain they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go back and buy us a little more food. But Judah said to him, The man wore on solemnly, You will not see my face again unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother along with us, we will go down and buy food for you. But, you will not, uh, but if you will not send him, he will not go down, because the man said, You will not see my face again unless your brother is with us. Now Jacob reacted. There comes a reaction from Israel. That's what he says. Why did you bring this trouble on me by telling the man you had another brother? Why was Jacob troubled? Why did it touch him so much? Because he realized that the only way how they would be able to live is if he would let go of the thing that is closest to his heart, his most prized possession, the one that is dearest to him, Benjamin. And he said, why did you bring this trouble on me? He was troubled in his heart. But he realized the only way how they would be able to live is if he had to let go of the thing that is closest to his heart. So they went back to Egypt. Now I'll tell you the rest of the story. That's in chapter 45. They went back, falling in the same lines, lines the rest of the world, day after day, sun, heat, and dust. And the Bible says this in verse 16. He says this, Joseph sitting there, when he saw Benjamin, when he saw Benjamin, 
He said to some of his stewards, go fetch those men. Come here. Go fetch those men. Standing in the rest, long line, standing down. He stands here late. Day after day after day. Joseph looking. Hey, familiar face. There's the catalyst. What do you do? Sister servants, go fetch that man. Here comes the men. Pick them out of the line in front of the other brothers and sisters of the rest of the world. And what did they do with them? They brought them into the cool of the king's palace. They said, oh, we must be dreaming. This cannot be. This is too good to be true. Look at all the splendor, the glory. Look at the marble floors, the curtains, and all of the furniture. Hey, and smell the meat. Be living out of bags of dry grain. You can get picked out of the line, church. You pastors have been standing in the same line as the rest of the world, day after day after day after day. And what is God looking for? He's looking for your Benjamin. He's looking for the one that's closest to your heart. He's looking for your most prized possession. And now that he's sitting at the table, Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. And they started to dish out the food. I don't even talk about the five times portion that Benjamin got. But in the mantles. But Pharaoh heard what happened. And he came there. He said, what, What's happening, Joseph? And Joseph, Oh, my Lord, these are my brothers I haven't seen for so long. And the Bible says that Pharaoh and all the officers of the court was happy and pleased. And you know what Pharaoh said to them? He said, Listen, do this. Take some carts and some oxen. Go back to your land. Hallelujah. That place you're struggling. Go back to your land. Go fetch your father. Go fetch your wives. Go fetch your children. Don't worry about your dilapidated car. Don't worry about your servants, your oxen, and your old simple house that you have. Don't worry about all of those things back home. Just come bring them to me, and I will give them the best that Egypt has to offer. Yeah. Hallelujah. The best that this world has to offer. So they went back. And they came to their father and said, Dad, we've got a story to tell you. And I think uh, Jacob was saying, Oh my God, don't tell me about Benjamin. He said, Dad, you know what? Joseph is still alive. And in fact, he's the great ruler of Egypt. You know what happened with Jacob? You read this, your Bible. He started to die. Because the Bible says, when he saw the carts and the oxen, the provision that came to take him back to Joseph. The spirit of their, of their father Jacob was revived. And now they went back to Egypt. And Joseph gave them the best of the land. The best that money could buy. What did Jacob get by sowing his Benjamin? He got the best that this world has to offer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He got a second thing back. He got back Joseph, the one that was stolen from him. If you will let go of your Benjamin, let me tell you something. God will withhold no good thing from you. He will give you the best that this world has to offer. But he will also cause the devil to give back those things that he has stolen from you over the years. Hallelujah. And the third thing, he got back his Benjamin. That shows to me that God is not really after your money, but he's after your heart. He wants to see where your heart is really at because he will give back that which you have given him in any way. Hallelujah. So church of Jesus Christ this morning, don't look at how much you have, but see how much you, don't keep back from God, but give Him everything that you can. Take this morning a Benjamin and say, my God, for too long have I stand in the queue like the rest of the world and the rest of the church. I want you to pick me out of the line this morning. Hallelujah. And let God pick you out of the line this morning and bring you right into the cool of the king palace let, it ch let him change your captivity so you can be like one that is dreaming this morning hallelujah it's time for you it's time for you as the church to realize that God will hold no good thing from you if you let go of the thing that touches your life first hallelujah so why don't you this morning 
Give God something that cost you something. Now you can understand why many times you've given, but you're still stuck in that same queue. Day after day, nothing has changed. Why? Because you're still sitting with the one that you treasured close in your pocket. You're not willing to let go of that thing that's close to your heart. But if you want to get picked out of the line, if you want God to change around your circumstances, then this morning you have to give God something that cost you something. I close with this. I can give you many testimonies of what God has done for me and for other people. You're looking at a man that's got no needs. I'm not bragging. It's a fact. Why? Because I love this principle. And I could say, as Andrew said, part of our tithes goes in this man's ministry. I'm not ashamed. Ask him. Why? I want God to pick me out of the line. I'm not, I'm not a fool. And my mama was raised no fool. If I see the principle, I understand it, I apply it. And that's what I do. Hallelujah. So why don't you this morning say, God, pick me out of the line. I'm sick and tired of my situation that I'm in. I'm sick and tired of the situation that my church is in. This morning, we're going to give something to this church, this ministry, that's going to cost us something. Even though we bleed this morning, it will be a sacrificial giving. It will be a Benjamin that will touch God's heart, a catalyst that would cause us to be picked out of the line. Hallelujah. Thank you, Corpus. Wow, man. Whew. Wow, I, <laughs> I think we need to give God a big shout for this word, man. Oh, man, I tell you, I, I, that was awesome. You know, and uh, uh, Annalise said the other day, if there's two men that can come teach the church about finances, it's Ed that was here yesterday and Ben that's teaching today. It's two men that live the principles and can show it. You know, we normally talk, but it's time to get people from outside that really has got the goods to show it and I'm not afraid to say that they can show it and uh, so this morning I know I haven't got everything with me but I've made a decision as I was sitting there so maybe you haven't got what you want to give but you can bring it tonight because this afternoon there's no offering time no. yeah you can't say maybe you know what every Monday when I get to office mm -hmm. I ask my secretary how much money is in the account mm -hmm. she said there's enough I said now all I want you to do is Give this that way, just send it there, send it there. I don't even know the amount. That's how we give. And I want to just say something. We don't have much money because we don't, we don't keep it in the bank. We keep it invested. Now we pledged this morning to give 10,000 Rand to this ministry. How much are you willing? Come on, let me see. Somebody else wants to give 10,000. Maybe you want to give 20,000. Come on, church, don't be afraid now. That's what I decided. I'm going to, that's what I was sitting there and I said, tonight I'm going to bring 10. Okay, uh, there's two tens. <laughs> we already got 20. There's one more. How much? Uh, 10. Mm. 10. 5. Mm. 10. What Come on. Mm. 10. 10. How many more? 10 million. 10. Come on, Come on, guys. 10 million. <laughs> Seems like you want to get stay stuck in the same old queue. Hallelujah. No, 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 no. How much can you give? How many of you can give five? Mm. Come on. Quality decision, man. That's all it is. Yeah. How about 2,000? Mm. How about, there's one. There's one. There's one. Mm. There's one. There's one. Hallelujah. Who else? There's one. Thank you, Jesus. This 10,000. 20,000. 22,000. Hallelujah. There's nothing wrong with money, people. Money yes. is as, as holy as you are or as evil as you are. Money is a dead thing. If it belongs to a gambler, it's gambling money. If it belongs to me, it's holy money. Thank you, Ben. So, uh, you got your pledge forms. If you haven't got them, just get a new one and fill it in.
and make a pledge and bring it later. But we're going to do the offering now. And the children's going to sing for us. So let's do that block, that block, and that block first. Okay? That block, this block, that block. When they finished, that block, this block, and that block. So that we skip a block so that people will not press upon another. Give what you've got in your hand now. Come sow it in the river and say, Lord, that is the opening of the door, but I'll bring my offering tonight. I'm serious. So, Father, we just pray over the seed. Thank you for this awesome word that Ben has just brought us. And I pray that it will bear good fruit in many hearts today. And, Lord, this is not a thing of seeing how big offering we can get. It's to break people through, to get them out of that begging line, to bring them into a place of abundance. A Lord, where the world can look at the church and say, we can see that God is with you. And we thank you that this is going to be a breakthrough offering this morning and this evening for God's glory in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want to tell you, the guy that's at this moment the richest in this area is Farouk Dangor. He speaks to me quite regularly. He said, Kubis, the only other guy in the northwest that I can see that God is with him is you. Muslim with speedy car sales. And he says it. And he says it to all his friends. I'm serious. I can tell you about one Muslim company upon another that phones us and say, Kubis, would you come bless our company because we're struggling this month. So what do you do, Kubis? I go bless it. Because the wealth of the wicked are laid up for the just. So as they are getting blessed, they, they're making money for us. Do you really bless a Muslim? Don't run away. Do you really? I say, yes. I stood there by Karabazar the other day. I said, now, Bani Anif, remember we're going to bless this business now, but it's for God's glory in the name of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> so I put my hands on the counters. One of my sons was with me, and I said, Eternal Heavenly Father, we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and not of Muhammad. And we say that this business be blessed so that the money can be used for God's kingdom. So when we want to buy stuff, we send the people there and they give us good discounts. You can walk through this parking area and see how many cars have got stickers at the back of Dada Motors. You'll be amazed. Three quarter of our church's cars come from Dada Motors. He just blesses this church with cars. If we get missionaries from overseas, he gives them a car for a month, pay the petrol and take the car back after a month without asking us any money. I say, why do you do it? He says, Corpus Pantieras met you. You don't have to take anything, but I can tell you lots of stuff. People, the church doesn't look at the miracles. You know what they do? Muslims. I'm talking about three, four Muslims in the area. They phone me. Corpus, I've got a sick man here. Would you just pray for him? I told him I'll just quickly get my priest on the line. Serious, 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 serious. They send people here with their little dumikis or palace. Pray then, go to pick and pay. Talk to the man there that's running the radio uh, shop there. Go talk to him. I mean, he was looking like a question mark. Serious. Two of my sons were with me. We stood there that day and he said, Hey, it is pain economy of I said, I can heal you. So I took his hand God healed him just like that he said Kubis how do you do it I said I'll tell you later <laughs> didn't enforce anything on him two weeks later I came and said Kubis I said can I tell you how you were healed I said it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ he took my hand in both his hands he said thank you Kubis thank you Okay, so uh, favor. God is giving us favor because of financial prosperity. So this day, let us do it. Come, let us do the kingdom stuff. Okay? Okay, so it's that block, this block, that block, then the other three. God bless you. Welcome again. And give us, you can. <laughs>
Just want Latanya's voice on, please. Latanya's the song. just took that song one day and modified it so uh, that it can suit the people of that age. <laughs> but he couldn't sing today, his voice is gone. But that was good. Thank you. Do you like the young people? Yeah, invite them to come play in your church, man. They do good. And uh, invite Ben to come preach in your church on finances to get a breakthrough. Mm. 
Hallelujah. So this morning, man, this morning. Remember this afternoon at 2 o'clock is a live recording with his songs? Wasn't it awesome last night? Now we can do better, man. Last night was just out of this world. So they're going to do a live recording here this afternoon for an hour. So instead of our worship, they're going to do a live recording DVD. So you're going to be on the DVD that's going to be sold worldwide. And then we're going to preach and go on. And tonight is our great meeting. And we trust it's going to be even greater than last night. So uh, because God is an excellent God, so everything in God must excel. It must always get better. God is a good God. So this morning I was going to go on with my father, my father. But I'll do it tonight, God willing, or this afternoon. Ah, ah, it's better than that who who of last night. I just felt in my spirit to do something that I really didn't want to do. So I'm going to preach a doctrinal thing this morning. If your children get to a certain age and they start becoming mature, then if you are a good parent, you teach them a few things. Normally by the time the, te the parents teach them, they already learned it in school by the friends. I'm just talking to mature people. But if you are a good parent, you'll take your children. And I remember when I took my sons and I talked to them, you know, they were so innocent because they just, all they know is church. And when I talked to them about the facts of life, especially Kubis and Johan, they just differ a year Peter is much younger than them. So when I talked to them, they said, Yes, Pa. <laughs> wow. Rabba, Pa. <laughs> when I talked to Peter, they said, Yeah, can I go long, Pa? So today, there are things that's going to confront you through the, through the years. And God must help us this morning. Many of you have maybe heard me touch this subject. But through the years, we've been confronted with doctrines that couldn't be proven right by the test of time. Books have been written that we call so-called end time stuff. And dates have been put in, names have been put in, and with a period of two to four years, all those books were proven wrong. Then they update the books and sell them again ten years later. They got the maps and the charts they preach with, and you see it on TV too, but they got to update the charts every so now and then because now certain people are dead that was supposed to be certain people. Now they got to change their charge. Now, is God a liar? I, I, I'm just going to touch on something deep this morning. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall it not come to pass? So if I say, the Lord has revealed unto me, like we heard last year on television in January, February, we heard it preached on national TV over and over again that the third of the third of the year 2003, blood would run in the streets of America and that will be the sign of the rise of the Antichrist. Blood didn't run and we didn't see a ruler come to be. You don't have to say anything, I'll just say it, it's facts. So we had the thing when the cards came out that you mustn't get a card then the master cards came out then the bank cards came out and then the barcodes came out and then the internet banking came out and every so now and then books were written about how this is now a sign of the so-called end time i call it so-called end. not one of that stuff has been proven right so why do we keep on believing the stuff if it's been proven wrong so I say to people, can't we just listen to the flip side of the coin and see if there's not another story to the book. 
that maybe can be proven right. And I think the greatest confusion and deception is because people speculate with scriptures that there's no revelation on it. How many know that a hundred years ago it wasn't good to speak in tongues? Come on, church. Two hundred years ago it wasn't good to be baptized. And people would have stand at the stake to be shot to prove that baptism was wrong and then that tongues was wrong. But as the years go on, God's revelation of His book is progressive. The stuff that Paul wrote, he didn't know everything he wrote. Some was prophecies because he calls himself a prophet. Some of the stuff that Peter wrote was prophecies because he called himself a prophet. So there's a lot of stuff that are progressively revealed to us. Now if we look at some stuff in the Bible, people stand and say, this is what the book says. And then somebody else says, no, this is what the book says. And we get ten different stories about the book because not one has got a revelation. But when it's revelation, it sets you free. Now God is not the author of either confusion or fear. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. So if my mind is confused, it's not sound anymore, it's not of God. If it's fearful, it's not of God. So God will not bring a message about of fear. So now we're standing in a time where a lot of, a lot of books have been written the last six to seven months. And they've been infiltrating is very getting very quiet as the religious spirits are already manifesting because they don't even know what I'm going to talk about. And the books came out a five set series. One, two, three, and then four, five. The Left Behind series. And because facts in those books are already within three months proven wrong, now the books are on special at the executive bookshops, CNA bookshops, PNA bookshops. You can go there. They're all on special now. They reduced by 60% because the sales dropped because the facts were wrong. And there weren't facts in the book because on the front it says a novel. So Paul writes to Timothy, he says, don't keep yourself up with novels. Nobody have to say anything. I'll just say it. It's there. Paul says, don't keep yourself up with novels. God is not a novel. God is truth. God is not a myth, although he's got mysteries. But God is truth. And John writes, he says, I have no greater joy than my children walk in truth. Okay? So the Bible is not a book to speculate with. It's a book to reveal truths. And if you read a portion and don't understand it, don't speculate with it. Tell your people, that portion I don't know yet. And your people will respect you for that. They, will don't think you, they won't think you're an idiot. I stood here yesterday and wrote a, read a few verses out of Revelation and I skipped a few verses and I said, why do I skip it? Because I don't know what it says. Come on, people. And I was serious. I don't. Because I can't see it anywhere else in the Bible that can prove to me what it really means. But in time to come, God will reveal it. So this morning, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I just want to be obedient. This is so far from this conference. But God says those things that are far will be brought near. <laughs> uchi, uchi, uchi. Put your hand in your Bible, say this is God's holy word, inspired by the Holy Ghost. So Holy Spirit, we don't want to hear the ideas of man. Let truth spring forth the way you've put it in here. Let it be revealed. Let truth come forth. Let lies disappear. Touch the man of God to speak truth to us. Touch my life to be open for truth in Jesus' name. Now there's a lot of films, maybe you got some through the post as well. We got a few videos that's been posted to us by one of the companies that's making this stuff, you know. And uh, they make these videos to scare people. And you know, we look at the videos and Jesus is not even mentioned in the videos. The name of Jesus is not even there. It's a scary thing about how the world's going to be in chaos, but Jesus is not even mentioned. So why do they make it and call it a Christian film? 
I'm not attacking or reaction. I am saying the facts of life. You're going to be faced, my child, with something. You are now 12. Within the next year, things are going to change. And you're going to be faced with a few things. So I want to help you before you are faced with it. So when you face it, you know how to handle it. So we are facing a lot of stuff now. Books are coming in hordes into the bookshops and not Christian bookshops. They sell them. They put them in the normal bookshops. When you go to the airport, they stand in rows there to catch you, to put you in fear. So thank you. Verse 18, chapter 1 of First Corinthians. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the kingdom for after that in the kingdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block unto the Greeks foolishness but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God chapter 2 verse 6 how about we speak wisdom among them that are perfect yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the princes of this world that come to naught but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world into our glory unto our glory which none of the princes listen to this which none of the princes of this world knew that word princes if you got another translation it would say rulers of this world knew for had they known it they would not have crucified the Lord of glory but as it is written I have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things even the deep things of God now where's Peter you see not here this morning so it seems like I have to read Holy Spirit help us this morning Paul says the thing we need to preach is Christ crucified last year we did a series on the crucified Christ something like 13 or what tapes and it was like God said the church has forgotten the power of the crucified Christ we so reveled around the resurrection that we forgot where the price was paid the price wasn't paid in the empty tomb the price was paid by the nailing of the cross that's where it all happened so 1 John <coughs> excuse me 1 John 3 and 8 says for this purpose the Son of God was made manifest to destroy the works of the evil one so how was the works of the evil one destroyed when Christ was crucified how do I know that just keep your hand then go to Colossians 2 quickly Holy Spirit help us this morning I'm going to go to that thing that is the major thing in the in the funny people today I got to read it in the amplified here he says verse 13 you who were dead in trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh your sensuality your sinful carnal nature God brought to life together with Christ having freely forgiven us all our transgressions I, 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 I put emphasis for you to just be happy God has freely forgiven you all our transgressions having cancelled blotted out wiped away 
the handwriting of the note with its legal decrees and demands which was in force and stood against us, this note with its regulations, decrees and demands, he set aside, cleared it completely out of the way by nailing it to his cross. God disarmed the principalities and powers that were ranged against us and made a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them in him and in the cross so it's in the cross that the rulers it's just one word were disarmed uh, it means their armament, I'm not going to touch on that today, that's an awesome scripture. Their armament was taken away. But just take it physically, they were disarmed. In Genesis, they were defeated. Okay, so, okay. Arms were taken off, feet were taken off, so uh, that's why they serpents. Okay. <laughs> no arms, no feet. <laughs> okay. Just help me. I've done this over and over again, but I want to do it again here today. Okay, what did God do with on the cross? Can you help me? There was a note, a legal decree, but it's called the law that gave power to sin, and that's what the devil used to accuse you. Without the law, sin have no power. So the legal decree that stood against you was the law that says you can't, 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 you must, you must, you must, and Satan used that to make you feel guilty. Now, this legal written doctrine that stood against you. Everybody with Amplified Bibles, there's the note that stood against you. Satan used it. What happened on the cross? Everybody shout out loud. First of all, he canceled. Have you ever got something with a stamp on it that says, cancel? He canceled it. What did he do after he canceled it? Now, blot out, you got to be older than a certain age to understand blot out. That's when we used the pens in school that was still fountain ink. And when you pull the pen out of the little bucket, it dropped ink on your school paper. And then you use blotting paper to get the ink out. And if you used it quickly, it didn't leave a mark. So he blotted it out with a blotting paper. So canceled, and after he canceled it, he blotted it out. Okay. Okay. It stood against you. Da, 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 da. You must, must, must. Then he canceled it. Canceled. Then he blotted it out. Then he. And then he. Read on. Then he. He set it aside, but there is nothing. So he set it aside, cleared it completely out of the way by nailing it to the cross. If that doesn't touch you, nothing will ever in this earth touch you. I've preached this now for 25 years and it still touches me every time I do it on a board. The written decree that stood against you. This was the disarming of the rulers that stood against you. He took that written decree of commands and demands that stood against you. He cancelled it, blotted it out, wiped it away, set it aside, completely took it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. So, if the rulers of this world knew they would not have crucified the Lord of glory so first Peter comes in first Peter 1 verse 10 11 and 12 it says all the prophets of old prophesied about the suffering that was to come upon the Christ and the glory that should follow so I have not seen and ear not heard neither come about the glory that is to follow after the crucifixion but the rulers of this world didn't know otherwise they would never have crucified them because they were disarmed by nailing Christ 
Christ to the cross and that's where everything was taken away that could ever stand against you so Christ purchased your freedom by dying on the cross you are liberated so stand in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and do not be again entangled with the yoke of bondage Ah. so John 12 listen to this one verse 31 now is the judgment of this world now shall the ruler of this world now many people are waiting for their world ruler to come to be stick with me and forget about the other stuff for one minute and listen to the other side for one minute he says Jesus is now on his way to the cross. He's washing his disciples' feet. He's having the last supper with them. So that is the last encounter with his disciples before he's going to be captured and crucified. So he says to the disciples, Now is the judgment. Now is the judgment. Not later. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be judged or, or cast out the ruler of this world will be cast out now he explains exactly how the judgment will happen and the ruler will be cast out he says and I if I be lifted up. Now I'm skipping a line there. I'm going to put it in here. He says that he's verse 31. Then he, I jump a line. He says, This he said, this signifying, signified what death he should die. So he says, If I be lifted up, in me, other words, from the earth to be crucified, that will be the judgment. We just saw it in Colossians 2. So when Christ was crucified, that's when the rulers were disarmed because everything they could use was taken out of the way, blotted out, cleared away, completely put aside when Christ was crucified so that you can now have the glory. If they knew, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. So Jesus prophesies, he says, now is the judgment. When I'm lifted up, signifying what type of death I should die, he said, that will be the judgment of the ruler of this world and his judgment is he will be cast out out of the presence of God. Now listen. If I be lifted up, I will draw all. Now, again, this is so awesome. And Arthur again emphasized it when he preached here. And, you know, and we got to get it and more people got to know it. If you got, open your Bible now, please, in the, in the King James Bible and in the Amplified, it says, I will draw all. Then it says in cursive, men to me now all the students in the house preachers in the house if it's in cursive in the King James it means it's not in the Greek now if you open the Amplified Bible you'll say they put see they put brackets there saying all people in brackets so if it's in brackets in the Amplified it says it's not in the original now if you read the whole of chapter 12 and 13 there's no mention made of people Jesus is talking about his crucifixion and the judgment of the rulers. Come on, church. So Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all. So take the cursive out. I will draw all to me. What is Jesus going to draw to him when he dies on the cross? judgment now is the judgment of this world now the ruler of this world will be judged or cast out and if I be lifted up I will draw all to me all what come on church all judgment that's the context of the scripture so Jesus says if I hang on the cross the thing that I draw I will draw all judgment I will draw all. Say it. Are you scared? Let's go to the crucifixion. Matthew 27. 
God will help you today to break through and go help the church out there and the world out there to understand what happened. That's why it's a stumbling block and an offense. The greatest offense is the crucifixion. We just wrote a whole pamphlet on the crucifix. How could you must wear an empty cross, not a full cross? Empty cross says nothing. What does the empty cross spell? Oh, but Christ is not on the cross, neither is he in the grave. So why do you go visit the grave? But Kubis, you can't keep Christ on the cross. Why do you sing about the cross? You can't keep Christ on the cross. Why do you write poems about the cross? You cry, can't keep Christ on the cross. Why do you preach Christ crucified? Paul says to Galatians, He was portrayed amongst you. Afrikaans afgeskilder as onreelige kruisig. Said I made him so real. It was like I had a painting in front of you that showed he was crucified. Interesting sake. Go to the book of Revelation. No, not now. What do you see in the book of Revelation, page after page? And I turned around and I saw a lamb as it was. So which lamb did he see in Revelation? The slain one. Where's the slain Christ? On the cross. And out of the throne and out of the lamb. Not the Lord. The lamb issues the river of life. So where from comes the river of life? Where from comes the cleansing stream? I know I'm touching religious heads now. So just bear with me. From where comes the river of life? From the open fountain. From the slain lamb of God. Zechariah chapter 13. I mean it comes from the lamb that was slain. That's why it's an offense. People don't like to preach crucified Christ. Let's look at the, res, the, the, the crucifixion. Yeah, this is awesome stuff, man. This is awesome stuff. When you meet, lead someone to the Lord, you say, Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Why do you want to put the cross up there? Why do you want to bring the crucified Christ in? That is the power of Almighty God. That's where God did that display. Okay, now we're going to have to write down a lot of stuff here. We're going to read Amplified and King James. The death of Jesus, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now we know that we've seen that in the Psalms. You know, some of them that stood there when they heard that said, The man calls for Elijah. Straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let it be. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Verse 50. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Now if you read the same portion in John 19, 30, Jesus said, it is finished. Other translation, it is done. Other translation, it is complete. It is finished. We're going to go slow and then we're going to go fast. Verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The veil was rent. Now we know that if we look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 21, and Hebrews 4, verse 4 through 16, that the real veil was the flesh body of Jesus. Remember? That was the new and living way, which he prepared through his blood, that is his flesh. Am I right to say that? You're all with me. We're talking to preachers. So when the veil was rent, I mean, everybody looked at the veil in the temple. But what actually happened is the true veil was opened. That's why when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, it wasn't after the resurrection on the way to heaven. 
it was at the last supper on the way to the cross so he didn't say I'm going to prepare a place in heaven he said I'm going to be crucified and that's where I'm going to prepare a place for you so I'm going to rent the veil to prepare a place so that you can come through the veil and I will be the way to the Father I am the way the truth the life the door that's the context of John 14 it's on the cross that he prepared the way not when he went to heaven because he was on the way to be crucified don't get too much of a fright here. I'm just touching on certain <laughs> Is it all right? Slight nerdy food here. Right? <laughs> veil was rent. That was his flesh body. That was the true veil that was rent. Let's go on. He says, And the earth did quake, and the rocks did rent. Okay? Earth shook. Earthquake. he says uh, and the graves were open and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose the saints were raised out of death is that okay? And they came out of their graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that, they were, that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly this was the Son of God. So they put an emphasis again on the earthquake and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Are you ready for revelation? Out loud, put your hand on your Bible, say, Holy Father in heaven, this day I'm ready for revelation knowledge like never before in Jesus' name. Okay, let's start with the saints who were raised. In John chapter 4, verse 38, Jesus is on his way and he goes through Samaria, needs be, and he go and sit at Jacob's well. The disciples go to Kentucky, they get hamburgers and chips, and Jesus is sitting there. So here comes a woman and Jesus says, give me water. She says, you've got nothing to draw the water with. And he says, uh, go call your husband. She says, I have none. She said, you had five. The one you have now is not your husband. She says, I perceive you are a prophet. Where shall we worship? Shall we worship in Jerusalem? Shall we worship in Samaria? On the mountain or in the temple? She said, the woman, the hour is coming now is when true worshipers will not go to the mountain and they will not go to Jerusalem. Because God is spirit and they that worship must worship in spirit and in truth. All right? So here comes the disciples back. They say, Lord, can we get you something to eat? He said, no, 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 no. I've eaten. They say, what have you eaten? He said, my meat is to do. I've got to put it here. My meat is to do the will of the Father and of him that sent me. Now, if you look at to do the will of the Father, it's there in John 6, and it's there in John 8, and it's there in John 12. It says, my meat or my food is to do His will and to finish it. Now, listen, my, will is to, my meat is to do the will of the Father and to finish it. And then Jesus changed the subject. He said, do you not say, it is yet four months to the harvest I'm just putting down stuff and then we're going to preach on everything that's on the board do you not say it's four months to the I say unto you lift up your eyes and see that the fields are already white unto harvest pray he the Lord of the harvest to send laborers in the harvest for many 
have labored. And you will enter their labor. So Jesus says, I'm talking about a harvest that's going to be gathered. But people have for years and years worked for this harvest. Now this harvest is here. But they that labored are not going to get the fruit of the harvest. But you will go into their harvest and get the harvest that they labored for. Now, that you also get in Revelation 14, 13, where it says, Blessed are those that die in Christ now, for they do rest from their works, but their labors do follow them. Rest from their labor, but their works do follow them. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Seeing that we've got a great cloud yesterday morning, of witnesses surrounding us. Let us lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily beset us. So, are you with me? I, I'm, I'm trying to put the. He says, the saints were raised out of the dead when Jesus was crucified. But on the way there, Jesus said, talking about a harvest, many have labored, they are now dead. But you will enter their labor and you will partake of the harvest. Is that all right? So those that were raised from the dead when Jesus was crucified formed a cloud of witnesses. The Bible says we are now surrounded with a cloud of witnesses. So the saints of the Old Testament are not in Hades at the moment. They are in a cloud that is called the cloud of witnesses. Is that okay? So let's go to Revelation. Maybe we should first go to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah first. 63. I want to miss anything here. Holy Spirit. We should just put this one on here. This crucifixion, according to Hebrews 13 and 12, happened outside the city. If there's preachers in the house that love their church to say amen, and uh, it's true, you can do that. <laughs> it says, He suffered without the city. So let us go and, care and be, uh, be, uh, carry the reproach with him. Where? Outside the city. That's where he was crucified on Golgotha, outside the city. When he was crucified, he said it is finished. There was a, a veil rent that was his flesh body that opened the real Holy of Holies. There was a great earthquake and the saints came out of their tombs. But before that, Jesus said, do you not say it's four months till the harvest? I say unto many have labored, but you will enter their labor. And we talked about those that were raised from the dead formed a cloud of witnesses. Why did they have to form a cloud of witnesses? When Jesus came out of the tomb, peered unto the disciples for 40 days, and then he had to be taken away. And the Bible says in Revelation, in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 10, where he said, uh, go wait till you get the promise of the Father. And he said, verse 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then in verse 9, he says, and a cloud received him out of their sight. We had this idea that Jesus had opgevaar in die wolke. No, it says a cloud. I want to put that a welcoming party appeared and said Jesus we remember how you took us out now here we are here to, to, to take you up you don't have to believe it I'm just quoting facts so they were raised to form Acts 1 8 1 9's welcoming party a cloud received them out of their sight is that still right or is it too deep too much too rough okay a few more facts before we're going to preach. In Acts chapter 3 verse 13 it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. 
being made a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree so that the blessings of Abraham had come upon the Gentiles and we might receive the spirit through faith you all know that so Christ paid the price Isaiah 53 says who has believed our report and to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed yeah? and then it states in verse 5 he was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with these tribes we are healed so that's the report you got to believe who will believe the report that Jesus paid the price in full for sickness, disease, problems, sin, unrighteousness? Who will believe the report? Oh Lord, I'm just struggling a little bit to get on the way because this was not prepared and we've got a few stuff here that's totally different. But when he was lifted up, he will draw all judgment to him what is the judgment of all the sickness all the sin all the evil all the poverty all the unrighteousness come on say whatever you want now he says who believed this report who will believe this report now can I help you with people that's in the faith movement I don't know how there's any movement. 